Uh, thank you, Dana. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It, I have a, a huge pleasure to welcome you to Columbia University, and my big thanks to uh, the YIVO Institute for Jewish Rese Research, Fordham University, and the Institute of Israel and Jewish Studies at Columbia University, who uh, um, organized, uh, uh, practically, uh, today's um, event. Um, the initiative to organize the series uh, of lectures, uh, that one of them we host today, uh, came more than a year ago when Polish Parliament passed the so-called Holocaust Law, a law that would make the crime to ascribe responsibility to Poles for crimes committed by the Nazis in World War II. And as you may well know, the Holocaust Law caused a diplomatic rift between Poland and the US, and most of all between Poland and Israel, with Israeli, uh, um, and although the law has been softened in the summer of last year, the rift continues. And uh, this event today is even more important uh, because of that uh, continuing um, uh, controversy. And the series of lectures means to put in principle, Polish and Jewish perspectives in dialogue and present them in one room. The idea is just to bring scholars to talk about the same topic from different perspectives. Um, the first joint event has already took place at Fordham uh, University, um, uh, and there will be another one, a, a one-day symposium planned for May 5th at the YIVO. Um, and will uh, focus on the post-war period, including contemporary issues such as Poland's controversial law, including, and today, we'll he hear lectures of our distinguished guests talking about World War II um, and the contested issue of the Polish-Jewish relations in that period. I hope we can also tackle the problem of distinct historical memories this period evokes among <clears throat> Jews and Poles. Let me introduce our two distinguished guests. Um, and after the lecture, uh, we will open a, a Q&A. Our first speaker I have the pleasure to introduce tonight is Professor Samuel Kassau, who is a, the professor of history at Trinity College. Professor Kassau was born in a DP camp in St Stuttgart, Germany and grew up speaking Yiddish, and those who uh, attend YIVO events know it very, very well. Um, Professor Kassau attended the London School of Economics and Princeton University, where he earned a PhD in 1976 with a study about students and professors in Tsarist Russia. He's widely known for his award-winning, wonderful book I teach uh, a lot in my own classes, called Who Will Write Our History? Emanuel Ringelblum, The Warsaw Ghetto, and the Oinek Shabbos Archive. Uh, and uh, the book has been just released in a different form as a documentary film uh, um, very recently. Our next uh, speaker, uh, Piotr Wrubel, is a professor of Polish history, uh, the chair of Polish history at the University of Toronto. He graduated uh, from Warsaw uh, University, where he also obtained his PhD. And before coming to University of Toronto, he taught at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor you know, at University of California, Davis. He's the author and co-author of many publications dealing with interwar Poland, as well as Jews in Habsburg, Galicia. In 2006, he co-edited uh, the book called Nation and History, Polish Historians from the Enlightenment to the Second World War. The title of his current project is History of the Jews in Poland. And he also works on a broader issue of national minorities in Eastern Europe. Please join us in welcoming the speakers and enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Just in case, I'm not Sam Casso, I'm Piotr Wrubel. We decided to reverse the order because we decided as well that we have to uh, divide the labor. And since the topic of the evening is Polish-Jewish relations during World War II, I will talk about the Polish side and Professor Casso will talk about the Jewish side. 
And we believe that if we start with the Polish side, well, maybe it will be easier in some, in some respect. Um, okay, there is a lot of water here which adds. <laughs> Thank you very much for your um, generous introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me here to New York. It is hard to find a topic more challenging than Polish-Jewish relations during the Second World War. Emotionally loaded and frequently abused, it is difficult to research since it requires a good knowledge of several languages and Polish and Jewish history. Symptomatically, a list of publications on various aspects of the Holocaust in Poland fills hundreds of pages but there is no even one scholarly monograph under the title, The Holocaust in Poland. Frequently, Holocaust scholars are not familiar with the context of Polish history. Often, readers react angrily to Holocaust studies, forgetting that explanation is not justification. Finally, for about 40 years, the communist authorities in Poland did their best to disenable the Holocaust studies, and the Polish educational system produced at least two generations unfamiliar with this field. The present government of Poland and his acolytes do their best to rewrite history again. Approximately three and a half million Jews lived in Poland before 1939. Over 90% of them perished in the Holocaust which, after the Baltic states, amounts to the worst relative Jewish casualties in Europe. Most of the survivors, some 200,000, spent the war in the Soviet Union and kept returning to Poland until the late 50s. In June 1945, the Central Committee of Jews in Poland registered 74,000 survivors. Only approximately 20,000 of them survived on the so-called Aryan side in Poland, outside the Polish camps and the Soviet-controlled Polish army. Even if we double this number, assuming that some survivors did not register, or if we accept 50,000 given by the Institute of National Remembrance, these estimates are terrifying. Why did so few Jews survive in German-occupied Poland? Why was the survival rate higher in most German-occupied countries? The answer is complex. The German occupation in Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus was much more oppressive than anywhere in Europe. The occupation of Poland was also one of the longest in Europe. Contrary to many other states, subjugated by Germany, Poland was supposed to be ethnically cleansed and Germanized quickly. The Polish Jews were one of the least integrated Jewish communities in Europe. Most Polish Jews considered themselves a separate nation. There were few organic ties between Jews and Poles, and it was relatively easy to separate them even more. The Polish-Jewish relations deteriorated in the 30s. Yet, a question remains. What was the attitude of the Polish society to the murder of their Jewish neighbors? Undoubtedly, it was a Nazi project. And without the agency of the Third Reich, there would have been no Holocaust. The Germans killed the overwhelming majority of the Jews in Poland. Yet, had the Poles behaved differently than they did, the casualty rate would have been lower. The attitude of the Polish population toward the Jews evolved during the war. In early and mid-1939, anti-Semitism abated and Polish-Jewish solidarity widened. Jews generously supported the National Defense Fund about 120,000 Jewish soldiers fought in the September campaign of 1939, and thousands of Polish and Jewish soldiers and civilians 
became the victims of the terror unleashed by the Germans from the very first days of the war among approximately 66,000 soldiers of the Polish army who died defending their country, there were some 7,000 Jews. The Polish-Jewish solidarity was soon over. Already in October 39, anti-Jewish attitudes returned and the gulf between Poles and Jews deepened. The Nazi propaganda machine incited Poles against Jews. Some Poles followed this incitement. A culmination of this development was a pogrom against the Jews of Warsaw during Easter 1940, when hundreds of thugs attacked Jews on the streets of the city. Some of the assaults were joined and directed by the Germans. Most Poles failed to dissociate themselves from the violence. Only individuals try to stop it. The Germans eliminated the Jews from the Polish economy, and many ethnic Poles filled their places. This situation pleased Polish nationalists, who claimed that Jewish property rightfully belonged to the Poles, and that the return of the Jews was unacceptable. Jan Karski, the famous emissary of, of the Polish underground to the government in exile, went from occupied Poland to France in January 1940. He reported about Poles under the German occupation, I quote, the, <clears throat> the attitude toward the Jews is overwhelmingly severe, often without pity. A large percentage of them are benefiting from the rights that the new situation gives them. They frequently exploit those rights and often abuse them. This brings them, the Poles, to a certain extent nearer to the Germans." End of quote. Initially, many Poles believed that they were more persecuted than the Jews. In the early months of the war, the German invaders considered the Polish elites more dangerous than the Jews, and the Nazi killing machine was directed mostly against the Poles. Soon, however, the German priorities changed, and in 1941, the Nazis decided to murder all the Jews. In 1939, Poland was partitioned between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. Poles faced two enemies. Many Poles did not share this perspective, many Jews rather, did not share this perspective and considered the Soviets a lesser evil or even a savior. The Soviet occupation of Eastern Poland meant something else to Poles and Jews. To numerous young Jews, it brought new educational and vocational opportunities, and some joined the Soviet administration and security apparatus. For some time, Jews occupied a disproportionate position there. A keen perception appeared among Poles that Jews collaborated with the Soviets. Even though only a minority of Jews supported the Soviet system, most Poles accused Jews of disloyalty and treachery toward Poland at the moment of crisis. To the Poles, the, day, the establishment of the Soviet occupation was the time of national tragedy. To many Jews, these were the days of joys and new hopes. Most Jews, however, the intelligentsia, the Bund members, entrepreneurs, the religious people, did not share this attitude, but anxious and fearful hid their views. The Soviet propaganda promised equal treatment of all ethnic groups and claimed that the Red Army liberated Ukrainians, Belarusians, and the Jewish masses from the Polish oppression and encouraged the oppressed to take revenge against their class enemies. In the impoverished shtetls of Eastern Poland, there was resentment against the Polish rule and the Soviet propaganda had a broad appeal. In, 1940, in his 1940 report, Karski wrote, 
I quote, virtually all Poles are bitter and disappointed in relation to the Jews. The overwhelming majority, first among them, of course, the youth, literally took for, look forward to an opportunity for repayment in blood. The end of quote. The distorted perception of the Jewish involvement in the Soviet occupational system aligned itself with the stereotype of Judeo-communism, Zhida Komuna. In effect, the Polish behavior toward Jews under the German occupation, this affected the Polish behavior toward the Jews under the German occupation. In 1944, it strengthened a widespread belief that the Jews contributed to the establishment of the communist power in Poland when, again, the arrival of the Red Army meant something different to Poles and Jews. In, 1940, in 1939, the Polish government in exile and the National Council, a parliament in exile, were established in France. There were two pre-war politicians of Jewish background in the National Council. Hermann Liebermann from the Polish Socialist Party and the Zionist Ignacy Schwarzbart. Many Polish politicians in exile were hostile toward the Jews. It was particularly so among the members of the National Democracy, which became one of the four political parties that formed the government. Tens of thousands of men escaped from Poland in 1939 and joined the Polish military in the West. There was a group of Jews among them, but anti-Semitism reappeared in the army. The Jewish press in the West, particularly in Great Britain, wrote extensively about it, and the problem of the Polish soldiers of Jewish origin returned several times to the British Parliament. In August 1940, Sikorsky, the Prime Minister, issued an order threatening with severe punishment for anti-Semitism. The order was ignored by many officers and soldiers who were still exposed to anti-Semitic publications such as the paper Jestem Polakiem, I'm a Pole, published by former members of the pre-war National Radical Camp, ONR. The Polish government in exile faced pressure from Western Jewish organization. They demanded the government to issue a clear statement that after the war, Polish Jews would enjoy full equality. Sikorski refused, arguing that his government had already promised a democratic order in post-war Poland including equality for all citizens, regardless of their ethnicity. The survival of Polish state was at stake. The government did not consider the Jewish question the most critical problem. Yet, the Jewish organizations demanded a statement devoted specifically to the Jews. Sikorsky procrastinated, afraid that such a statement would weaken his political position in Poland. The Polish government issued, however, publications that described the Jewish occupational policies in Poland and the persecution of the Jews. The government's official organ, Dziennik Polski, gave relatively recent and accurate information about the Jewish situation in Poland, the brochure the Must Extermination of Jews in German-Occupied Poland, published in December 42 and sent to 26 governments, was the first official document informing the West about the Holocaust. Eventually, in November 40, the government issued a declaration which condemned the pre-war anti-Semitic anti policies of the Polish authorities and guaranteed full equal rights full equality to the Jews after the war. The declaration was badly received in occupied Poland and was not followed with new policies. No pressure was exerted on the underground organizations to integrate the Jews in the secret state. The Jewish organizations continued pressing the government 
and sometimes their demands reached beyond the power and ability of the Poles. The Polish-Jewish tension escalated even though the Polish socialists and the Bund tried to restore friendly Polish-Jewish relations. As Michael Steinlauf put it, the government in exile walked a tightrope. On the one hand, and I'm quoting Steinlauf right now, contending with Stalin for influence in Washington and London, the government was exposed to Western security and especially to that of American British Jews who found denouncing Polish anti-Semitism easier than criticizing their own governments in action in saving Jews. On the other hand, the government in exile was sensitive to reports from Poland, stressing the danger of being perceived by Poles as a government of the Jews. In 1940 and 41, most Polish Jews stigmatized as outcasts, robbed of their belonging, humiliated, socially isolated, forced to slave work, frequently uprooted and deported from one party, one part of the country to another, were sent to about 440 labor camps and 400 ghettos. This created another opportunity to rob the Jews who were forced to abandon or sell for almost nothing most of their property. In various parts of occupied Poland, local Nazi authorities applied slightly different policies toward the Jews, who became a bone of contention between the German civilian administration and the SS. The direct contact between the Polish and Jewish population was limited, but only the Wuj ghetto was sealed entirely. The ghettos in small towns were surrounded with improv improvised fences or were open, and the Poles were allowed to enter them. Many pre-war Polish Jewish political, social, professional education and family networks continued their activities and brought help to the Jews. To avoid starvation, the ghetto inhabitants smuggled food from outside. An entire smuggling industry developed. Even the relatively well-guarded ghetto of Warsaw was connected with the outside world with a telephone network. <laughs> network. The German policemen and their Polish and Jewish assistants watching over the ghetto gates gladly accepted bribes and allowed to move transports of food into the ghetto. Some 80% of the food consumed in the ghetto was smuggled, but it was a costly operation. The prices were between 10 and 73% higher than outside. The smugglers and their German and Polish suppliers made fortunes. The Jews were losing their last resources, selling virtually everything they had. Most Jews leaving the ghettos to look for food and shelter did it on their own. Frequently on the Aryan side, there, were, there met blackmailers, often more than one or two. The German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 41 opened a new stage of the Holocaust. The previous persecutions of the Jews paled in comparison with savage cruelty unleashed by the Nazis. The Einsatzgruppen following the units of the Wehrmacht killed about one million Jews, mostly the pre-war Polish citizen, citizens, until the end of 1941. In some localities, the Einsatzgruppen murdered most of local Jews. At the same time, the Nazis encouraged the local population sometimes discreetly, sometimes openly, to participate in the murder. Both Germans and locals were looking for the people who had collaborated with the Soviet administration but did not manage to escape. In many towns of Eastern Poland, taken by the Germans, the Polish, Lithuanian, and Ukrainian population participated in violent pogroms. Most of them started instantly after the arrival of the Wehrmacht and were perpetrated in each case by dozens 
or even hundreds of locals. During the first days of the German occupation of Lvov, or Lviv, Ukrainians and Poles murdered over 4,000 Jews. Many Poles, according to General Stefan Grotrovetsky, the commander-in-chief of the Home Army, greeted the Germans, I quote, as liberators from the Bolshevik oppression in which Jews had played a great part. Rovetsky also wrote in his report to London that, and this is a quote from Rovetsky as well, the overwhelming majority of the population is anti-Semitic, end of quote. Many Poles, according to General Rovetsky, the commander-in-chief of the Home Army, in 1942, pardon me, in 1942, the Nazis organized a network of death camps in Poland where the Jews were murdered on a massive scale. The camps were located in Poland for transportation and demographic reasons. The Polish Jewry was larger than all other European Jewish communities put together except for the Soviet Union. Approximately 2.7 million Jews were killed until the end of 1942 when very few Polish Jews remained. Even during this, even during this unprecedented genocide, most of the Polish underground parties opposed equal rights for the Jews after the war. Even though only the radical right condoned killing Jews, most other parties, except for the socialists and some small left-wing groups, favored emigration of the survivors as the solution of the Jewish question and hoped that the post-war Poland would be free of Jews. It was still possible to be a Polish patriot and an anti-Semite. Since late 1941, the Polish government in exile continued receiving reports from occupied Poland about the mass murder of Jews and became the primary source of information about it for the world public opinion. In February 42, the government issued a declaration promising equal rights to the Jews. In October 42, during a mass meeting at Albert Hall in London, Prime Minister Sikorski assured the Jews of their rights in Poland after the war and warned the Germans that they would be held responsible for their crimes. The latter point was strengthened in the declaration of November 27th, which talked about the mass murder of the Jews in Poland. In late 42, Karski crossed German-occupied Europe from Poland for the second time and brought to the West news about the Holocaust. He tried to alarm Western leaders, including President Roosevelt, and to convince them that immediate help to the Jews was necessary. He faced disbelief and lack of interest. The government did not appeal to Poles to help the Jews, did not press the underground state for action, and delivered limited help to the initiatives in Poland. One of these initiatives was Zegota, the Council for Aid to the Jews, established at the end of 42. Until mid-44, it supported financially between three and 4,000 hidden Jews and provided many of them with other kinds of help, including some 50,000 forged Aryan documents. Irena Sendler, the head of the child section of Zegota, helped to save over 2,000 Jewish kids. In the context of the German occupation, this was a heroic effort, but some scholars argue with more help from the Polish government in exile, these results would have been better. Before Zagota, until the end of 1942, the Polish underground state did not organize any help to the Jews. In April 43, before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the Home Army gave the Jews a small number of arms. 
During the uprising, minor units of our car and Communist People's Guard attacked the Germans and helped to evacuate the surviving fighters, Jewish fighters. They did not manage to destroy and open the ghetto walls. Also, in April 43, Jankowski, the head of the Delegate Bureau, the underground representation of the government in exile, appealed to the Poles to help the Jews. Yet, the Polish authorities were afraid that a more extensive occupation could trigger a premature uprising. During the Nazi extermination operations against the Polish Jews, a number of them escaped and hid. Most scholars believe that the escapees constituted about 10% of the Jewish population locked in the ghettos, which would mean between 200 and 300,000 people. Their lives were to a significant degree in Polish hands. The last third stage of the Jewish genocide in Poland from the beginning of 80, 1943 to the so-called liberation of Poland in 45 is frequently called the late Holocaust or the Judenjagd, hunt for the Jews. By then, the German occupational apparatus in most Polish territories was rather thin. Since between 20 and 40,000 Jews survived in German-occupied Poland, a question appears. Who murdered between 160 and um, 60,000 60, hidden Jews? It means that 60% of hidden Jews, or in other words, two out of every three Jewish escapees were murdered. It is difficult to estimate how many Poles helped the Jews. Usually a figure between 100,000 and 240,000 appears out of about 25 million Poles. The, assistant, the assistance to the Jews was very different from offering someone on a death transport a drink of water to hiding entire Jewish families. Most helpers were paid for the assistance. Many did it just for the money. And sometimes when the Jewish money was spent or the hiding operation became too risky, they killed their Jews or handed them over to the Germans. But some helped for altruistic reasons. Survivors came saviors, pardon me, came from all classes of the society and were heroes since they were threatened not only by the Germans but also by our own neighbors. The risk of denouncement was a constant daily phenomenon. Most hidden Jews changed their shelters many times and usually um, several people were, requ were required to save a Jew. In every county, um, in every county of general government occupied Poland, and there were 57 of these counties, between several and several dozens of Poles were killed for helping the Jews. In other words, hundreds of Poles lost their lives helping the Jews in over 200 localities. In some cases, entire villages were burned and several dozens of people were killing for saving the Jews. Approximately 80% of killed saviors were murdered in the countryside and smaller towns, about 10% in Warsaw and the rest in the major cities of Poland. Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, offers a list of almost 27 righteous people who saved Jews. The largest group, one fourth of them, close to 7,000, um, came from Poland. However, considering numbers of Jews in particular countries, 
and various aspects of the German occupation, it is difficult to draw conclusions based on these statistics. The authors of the monumental book, Dale is not, it's still a night, researched nine rural communities of German-occupied Poland. Their data tell more about hiding Jews in the countryside and small towns during the last phase of the Holocaust after the liquidation of the ghettos. And please listen carefully, it's not about the numbers, it's about proportions. Um, in the Bielsk Podlaski County, 1,300 Jews hit, 320 survived, Yad Vashem honored 18 families for help. In the Bilgorai country, 1,500 Jews hit, 274 survived, 13 families helped. In the Bochnia county, 1,100 escapees, 400 survivors, 20 families helped. In the Dembica country, 720 Jews hid, 230 survived, 103 individuals helped. In the Wukov country, almost 1,000 escapees, 140 survivors, um, nine helping um, families, etc., etc. Altogether, in these nine countries, 12,000 Jews hid and 3,000 survived thanks to 70 families and 267 individuals. Most hidden Jews, argues the, argue the authors of the book, were killed by Jews or with their active help. Surprisingly, and this is my big discovery recently, surprisingly, the conclusions reached by Marek uh, Jan Chodakiewicz, one of the top, top Polish national historians, are not dramatically different, albeit delivered in a different language. In his study of the Janów County in the Lublin district, Chodakiewicz writes, I quote, between the spring of 1942 and summer of 1944, out of estimated 1,000 Jewish fugitives, perhaps 400 may have been tracked down and given special treatments, uh, treatment during Jew hunt, Jew hunt and anti-partisan actions. Furthermore, over 300 fugitive Jews died at the hands of the bandits, independentists, communists, and Polish collaborators." End of quote. An attached table shows 19,000 Jews in the country in early 42, um, 3,000 in March 43, and 192 survivors in June 44. So in other words, it appears that Horodakiewicz shares the assessment that in the general government, Poles murdered more Jews than they saved. Among the helpers, there were also people who wanted to remove the Jews from Poland after the war and deprive them of their political rights. Even among the organizers of Zagota, there were people unfriendly toward the Jews. Zofia Kosak-Szczutska, a Catholic national writer who wrote a leaflet that triggered the organization of Zagota, condemned the silence around the murder of the Jews, equated it with complic complicity with the murderers, and called upon the Poles to protect and help, even though she wrote in the same leaflet, I quote, our feelings about the Jews have not changed. We have not ceased to regard them as political, economic, and ideologic, ideological enemies of Poland. Furthermore, we recognize that they hate us more than the Germans, that they hold us responsible for their misfortunes." The end of quote. There were several categories of Poles who helped to murder the Jews or did it themselves. One of them was the blackmailers, Schmalzownicy. 
They extorted money from hidden Jews and Polish helpers. As late as 43, the delegatura ordered to try and execute them. But it appears that only several people were punished only for blackmail. In Warsaw, the first execution for betraying the Jews to the Germans took place in August 43. And the next two traitors were killed in December 43. Both the Jews and the helpers believed that the more active stand against blackmail blackmailers was feasible and would save lives. Equally dangerous were paid informers of criminal policy, some of them recruited among housing administration and Polish clerks. Finally, there is the issue of the Polish police. Restored by the Nazis in, the late, in late 39, it included about 10,000 men, about one third of the pre-war Polish state, the police state, the state police. About 30% of the blue police belonged to the Polish underground. Among other responsibilities, the police enforced the German rules, guarded the ghettos, supervised the Jewish police, rounded up Jews for transport to Kielich centers, participated in the hunt for the Jews, and sometimes carried out executions. Individual policemen, policemen's behavior toward the Jews varied. Some helped, but much more numerous, motivated by greed and personal ideological views, robbed the Jews, blackmailed, and killed them. Emanuel Ringelblum, the chronicler of the Warsaw Ghetto, considered the Polish police worse than the German. Sometimes the Polish and German police were assisted by the Baudienst, German organized building service, the fire brigades, and the so-called night watch, guarding the villages. Also, the activities of the Polish underground remain controversial. People of Jewish background or Jews served in various cells of the Home Army, including its high command. Yet, almost always, the Home Army field units rejected Jews, and the underground state was basically for Poles only. AK commanders usually consider Jews as security risk or even enemies. There was a widespread perception in the Polish underground of the Jewish alleged sympathy for communism and alleged inability to fight, which would make a transfer of source where scarce weapons to the Jews a waste. The communist guerrilla was friendlier to Jews, but sometimes it murdered them as well. The right-wing national armed forces were openly hostile to the Jews and murdered them. The notorious order of August 43 issued by the then AK commander-in-chief Burka Morowski warned of gangs of robbers. I quote, uh, the latter recruit from all kinds of criminal subversive elements. Men and women, especially Jewish women, participate in the assault. The end of quote. After protests within the Home Army, the order was withdrawn. Also, the attitude of the Catholic Church toward Jews under the German occupation stirs disagreement. Before the war, the Church contributed greatly to the rise of anti-Jewish atmosphere in Poland. The Jewish section of Primate Hlon's past pastoral letter of 1936 is plainly an anti-Semitic text, which is striking in comparison with the encyclical of Pius XI, uh, Mit Brennender Sorge, written at the same time. The church's attitude toward Jews did not change after September 39. Throughout the war, the Polish Episcopate did not issue a single statement in defense of the Jews and did not try to influence the underground to help them. The Germans murdered one-fifth of the Polish clergy and the Polish religious leaders 
usually hostile towards the Jews, claimed that they did not want to cause further repression. Local clergy, however, assumed various positions. Many priests did not help or even warn the parishioners to stay away from the Jews, but others were saving Jewish lives, producing, for example, thousands of forged baptismal documents. Two thirds of the Polish nunneries were involved in saving Jewish children and adults. And this was done with the support of the church hierarchy. The nuns saved over 1,500 children. A number of monks and nuns paid for this with their lives shot by the Germans. It is impossible to precisely describe the groups of saviors, perpetrators, and bystanders in numerical terms. Israel Gutmann, Shmuel Krakowski, and Yehuda Bauer base their assessment on Ringelblum's Polish-Jewish relations during the Second World War and believed that, in Bauer's words, a quote, the majority of Poles evinced an indifference, often rather hostile, to the fate of the Jews, expressed in a lack of basic human interest in their fate. A fairly large minority was actively hostile to the Jews, and a smaller minority was friendly and helpful. The end of quote. In 1970, Shimon Dattner, a survivor and one of the most competent researchers of the Holocaust in Poland, served as the director of the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and fought desperately to save it from liquidation. And this is an important context, because in the same year, Dattner published an article that described many cases of hidden Jews murdered in occupied Poland by Germans and their local helpers. And Dattner concluded, I quote, in one of my works, I estimated the number of saved Jews to be approximately 100,000, mainly thanks to the help of the Polish population. I calculate also roughly that at least another 100,000 victims were caught by the organs of the occupiers and murdered. Both Polish saviors and perpetrators constituted minorities um, within the Polish society. A majority belonged to a category called by Raoul Hilberg bystanders. Jan Tomasz Gross recalls Albert Camus' statement that people are responsible not only for what they did, but also for what they did not. Gross postulates that the term bystanders should be replaced, at least in many cases, with facilitators and beneficiaries. At the same time, however, and this is this last extremely interesting book, at the same time, he also says that even his mother and the entire Polish progressive intelligentsia during the war and after the war was unable to fully comprehend the participation of Poles in the killing of Jews. Well, how to conclude a lecture like this? It's very difficult. A memory of Polish-Jewish relations during the Second World War is an open wound and an unresolved issue. It returns to Polish and international debates frequently, especially frequently in the context of international and Polish political drive towards nationalism and populism. Starting with the early 80s, a significant progress has been done in Poland in the field of Jewish and Holocaust studies. There is a danger now that at least part of this achievement 
of the last 30 years will be wasted. Thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me here. Uh, we are coming together uh, during one of those predictable and periodic flare-ups in Polish-Jewish relations marked by simplistic and inaccurate statements from both Poles and Jews. The present Polish government, as we all know, is engaged right now in encouraging a somewhat skewed and rosy narrative of Polish-Jewish relations during the war. I happened to be at the 75th anniversary uh, ceremony uh, commemorating the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and uh, the president of Poland uh, sincerely and very emphatically emphasized that the Polish nation, despite its own terrible suffering, had extended enormous help to the Jewish population, had fought side by side with the beleaguered Jews, that Chigota was a symbol of uh, Polish determination to help their fellow citizens. And the only thing that President Duda did not say is that the Germans built the walls around the Warsaw Ghetto to keep out the hundreds of thousands of Poles who were clamoring to get in to all help Jews. On the other hand, we have Israel Katz, just the other day, repeating what Yitzhak Shamir said many years ago, that Poles imbibe anti-Semitism with their mother's milk. And being a child of Holocaust survivors, this is something that I heard very often. But both of these narratives take us back to the, what I used to think were the bad old days when Poles and Jews, I thought, used to hurl accusations at each other. But beginning in the 1980s with conferences at Oxford, Brandeis, Jerusalem, I thought that a new era of dialogue would begin where academic research would replace impassioned accusations. But, unfor but unfortunately, the enormous number, are you able to hear me? Oh, okay. But unfortunately, the enormous number of good studies of this complex topic has had very little impact on popular understanding. Most Jewish survivors from Poland nourished, and I could say this firsthand, a deep hatred for Poles in Poland, and many seem to misread any search for nuance for an attempt to apologize and whitewash what they saw as Polish betrayal and complicity in mass murder. Many Poles, on the other hand, deeply aware of Polish suffering in the war, and rightly proud of their nation's resistance to the Germans, deeply resented what they regarded as a Jewish obsession with besmirching the honor of the beleaguered and valiant nation. And both sides saw the discussion as a zero-sum game, where assertions of Polish complicity seemingly canceled out Jigota and the Polish righteous Gentiles, who were the most of any nation, where assertions, however true, of Polish betrayal seemingly canceled out the 1944 uprising, where more Poles lost their lives than Japanese victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Now, truth be told, this is a very complicated issue, as you can guess. In other occupied countries, as we just heard, the anti-Semites tended to collaborate with the Germans. In Poland, while anti-Semitism, to quote Jan Karski, indeed served as a narrow bridge that linked Poles to Germans, Polish anti-Semites were also, very often, valiant fighters against the Germans. 
But the great thing about being a historian is that we're paid to untangle complicated problems and to provide multiple levels of nuance for which we never get any thanks. And while the enormous number of serious books about Polish-Jewish relations in the last 30 years have not eliminated name-calling and simplistic accusations, it has certainly given us a much better sense of what's happened. So as you heard, Piotr, Professor Frubel was taking the Polish side, and I'm now gonna focus on the Jewish side. Now, the first thing I wanna emphasize is that I am basing my remarks almost entirely on Jewish sources written during the war, rather than memoirs. Uh, and uh, the reason for this we can talk about afterward. Uh, and this is significant because if we concentrate on what Jews were writing in real time and not looking back ex post facto, then we see, and Professor Javi Dreyfus has written a very important book about this subject in Hebrew, which has not been translated, and I deal with the same issue in my book on Emanuel Ringelblum. But if we concentrate on what Jews were writing in real time, not what they were writing after the war, we see that until 1942, Jewish sources do not, I repeat, they do not show unambiguous hostility towards Poles. On the contrary, the sources that we have show a great deal of positive feelings. The, the, the feelings of hostility and betrayal come to predominate only after the beginning of mass murder in 1942. Now, to better understand this issue, I need to say a few things about how Poles and Jews were getting along before the war, and the simple answer, of course, was not well. In fact, we might even say that in the late 1930s, Polish-Jewish relations had reached a low point. Uh, but just before the outbreak of the war, there was an improvement which many Jews hoped would heralded a new and better relationship. Now, the death of Pilsudski in 1935 began a sharp turn for the worse in Polish-Jewish relations. Most Polish Jews mourned Pilsudski's death with very good reason. Although he failed to satisfy many Jewish complaints, Pilsudski saw Jews as citizens of Poland, not as unwanted aliens. He saw them as an integral part of a multi-ethnic Poland. After Pilsudski died, Polish-Jewish relations go downhill. The extreme anti-Semitic discourse that had been in the margins of the Polish political spectrum now became the mainstream. The national democratic conception of Poland, a Polish nation state where Jews were undesirable aliens, now became the uh, uh, announced policy of the government. And we have the economic boycott, albeit as the government stipulated without violence, ghetto benches in the universities, restrictions on ritual slaughter, the Polish government openly calling for mass Jewish migration from Poland, violent clashes between Jews and Poles, as well as pogroms breaking out in many towns. Uh, and this crisis, in turn, facilitated a far-reaching transformation in Jewish politics. Polish Jewry was backed up against a wall, and having nowhere to go, it moved in the direction of the Jewish labor bund, the bund that preached the policy of doigkeit, hereness. Our lives are here, Poland is our home, we will fight any attempt to push us out. So the bund on the eve of the war suddenly became the strongest Jewish party in Poland. In Warsaw, won 62% of the Jewish vote in the 1938 municipal elections, 18 out of 20 Jewish council seats. The same could be said for Lodz, Vilna, and uh, Bialystok. Now, Jews on the eve of the war did not become Marxist, as the newspaper Heint said, the Yidden haben gestimmt für den Bund allen gesagt zu Mincha, the Jews voted for the Bund on their way to Mincha, on their way to the afternoon prayers. But it's significant to point out that one reason, there were many reasons for the strong support of the Bund, but one important reason 
was that this was the only Jewish political party that had an ally on the Polish street, i.e. the PPS, the Polish Socialist Party, which at least officially denounced anti-Semitism. And this showed the incredible, intense, deep desire of Polish Jewry to find some partner uh, who could remind them, who could assure them that not, that not all their Polish neighbors were uh, hostile. And there's an irony in all of this which is that even as Polish-Jewish relations worship, the 1930s saw an unprecedented level of acculturation. 25% of Jews now spoke Polish as their first language. 80% of Jewish children were getting their primary education in the Polish language. In secondary education, the figure rose to 95%. This combination of anti-Semitism and acculturation deepened the anguish and alienation of an entire generation of Jewish youth. In school, they acquired a genuine love of Polish culture, an admiration for the Polish struggles for independence, and yet at every step they were reminded that they were inferior, that they were Jews. The implications of this complex irony rejection on the one hand, uh, absorption of Polish culture on the other, the implications were far-reaching. Bitter resentment of Polish anti-Semitism often went hand in hand with sincere Polish patriotism. What uh, uh, Katrin Stefan called Jewish Polishness, which distinguished between Poland and them. Them are the people trying to beat us up. Them are the anti-Semites. But the real Poland, the real Poland is Mickiewicz, Slovatsky, Pilsudski, the glorious traditions of the fight for independence. And someday that Poland will hopefully come to the surface once again. Polish Jews by the 1930s had a very strong sense of their nationhood. They were Jewish and they were proud of it. But much of that sense of Jewish identity was shaped by Polish as well as Jewish sensibilities. Now, by late 1938, many Jews believed they were seeing the first signs of hope. The PPS, the Polish Socialist Party, made important gains in the 1938 elections. The Polish Peasant Party, unlike 1935, at their 1938 convention, passed over the Jewish question in silence instead of passing an anti-Semitic uh, plank. There were growing signs that the Polish peasants were beginning to ignore the boycott. Here and there, voices among former Pilsudskiites began to question the utility of anti-Semitism. And it was this very hope that the real Poland would emerge that animated many Jews in the first days of the war and, of course, in the period leading up to the war. 1939 started off badly. Poland received honored guests, a wonderful reception for Herr Himmler. He was received by the head of the Warsaw police. And then, of course, a very distinguished guest, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister. The Polish same with, with an incredible sense of what really threatened Poland and what its priorities were, engaged in a debate about further restricting Jewish ritual slaughter. This was the biggest problem Poland faced in 1939. But then, of course, the cat jumped out of the bag. The German demands on Danzig now could no longer be kept secret, and Poland prepared prepared for war. In the face of the German threat, little by little, concrete uh, 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 anti-Semitism began to decline. Ringelblum wrote that for the first time in years, you could walk down the street and not feel like a pariah. Polish Jews enthusiastically subscribed to the war defense loan. They helped dig uh, trenches. On August 6, 1939, the Marshal of Poland, Szwigli Ritz, made a speech which many Jews interpreted as another sign of hope. Instead of using the term rodacy, which meant fellow Poles, he used the term obywatele, fellow citizens. And uh, this hope that Poland would make the transition from an ethnic definition of 
of uh, belonging to a civic definition now began to uh, uh, become more real. When the war broke out, as you heard, at least 100,000 Jews served in the Polish army. Uh, Jews uh, showed incredible bravery during air raids, standing their watch on rooftops, uh, extinguishing incendiary bombs. Uh, Jewish house committees in Warsaw welcomed Polish Catholic refugees from the Poznan region. There, there is a great deal of evidence to show that at least for that short time, there was that temporary uh, coming uh, uh, together. Now, the person who perhaps uh, did the most to collect documents about the Polish-Jewish relationship in real time was Emanuel Ringelblum, who, being a Marxist, never agreed with the idea that anti-Semitism is baked into your genes, that it's it, inevitable. He believed that the day would come when Poles and Jews would live together and that anti-Semitism was imposed from above, but it could be uh, combated and eventually eliminated. And in his uh, early writings about Polish-Jewish relations and in the writings of other members of the Oynik Shabbos, like Peret Sopachinsky and, uh, and Abraham Levin, you see a, a great deal of positive material, some negative material, but the point is that it's a mixed picture. On the positive side, uh, many of the Jewish refugees who left their homes in 1939 uh, reported that uh, Polish peasants were very helpful to them, gave, uh, gave them food, let them sleep in uh, barns. Many Jews reported that Polish army units uh, uh, treated them very well as they were uh, on, on the road with no home. There are many accounts of the bravery of Jewish soldiers. Uh, there are many accounts of how when Jews first entered ghettos, their Polish neighbors came to give them food and to give them moral support. A key issue here is smuggling. The, uh, if a Jew in the Warsaw ghetto simply ate the uh, allotted ration uh, at the most, at the very most, there would be 600 calories a day. The fact that 80% of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were still alive when the deportations to Treblinka began meant that massive smuggling had kept uh, the Jewish population fed. About 90% of the calories in the Warsaw Ghetto were uh, uh, smuggled in, and this could not have happened without the Poles. Now, you could interpret this by saying the Poles made a fortune out of this, but it's significant that the Ringelblum writers, the people who wrote for the Ringelblum archive, like Peretz Opachinsky, chose to interpret this not as self-interest, but as evidence of the fact that the two peoples needed each other, and that had it not been for the Poles, the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto would have all starved to death. Now, there was also a great deal of negative material before 1942. The uh, uh, attacks, by Polish soldiers on Jewish comrades in arms in the POW camps, the nefarious role of the Polish uh, police, the pogrom in Warsaw in 1940, uh, where, according to Ringelblum, uh, there was a great deal of indifference and very little willingness to help Jews. The many Poles who were enriching themselves by helping themselves to Jewish property, crowds laughing at Jews being led to forced labor. But as uh, Javi Dreyfus shows, before 1942, these negative uh, developments tended to be interpreted by many Jews as uh, the fault of marginal elements in Polish society. Instead of being identified as Poles, or instead of being identified as being typical of the whole Polish people, they were identified as the dregs of uh, society. Now, that uh, 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 attitude towards the Poles changed totally after 1942. Ringelblum's attempt to be open-minded 
extended to a particularly charged and sensitive issue, Polish charges that the Jews had welcomed the Soviets en masse in 1939 and had betrayed Poland. Rather than refute these charges outright, Ringelblum, before 1942, patiently collected documents and testimonies, those showing Jewish opposition to the Soviets, as well as documents showing that some Jews had indeed welcomed the Red Army and had indeed jeered Poles. Ringelblum believed that Jewish support of the Soviets was wildly exaggerated, but he was trying to keep an open mind for what he hoped would be a frank discussion after Poland regained its independence when the war was over. Getting material on Polish-Jewish relations meant reaching out beyond Warsaw, and the Oynik Shabbos amassed more than 400 reports from other cities and other shtetls. And here's what Ringelblum writes in 1942, and I'm quoting directly, there is a widespread opinion among Jews that anti-Semitism has increased sharply during the time of the war, and that most Poles are happy about the misfortunes that have beset Jews in the cities and small towns of Poland. But the attentive reader of our materials will find hundreds of documents which show the opposite. In more than one report from Mishtetl, he will read how warmly the Polish population uh, treated Jewish refugees. You will find hundreds of examples of peasants hiding and feeding Jewish refugees from nearby Shtetlach. On June 7, 1942, Abraham Levin writes in his diary that the war had favorably influenced Polish-Jewish relations. I quote, by the way, I think this is crazy, but I'm quoting what he wrote, the majority of Poles have been gripped by philo-Semitic feelings. I see Polish-Jewish relations in a bright light. I think that this war will wash this earth of ours clean of much filth and savagery. There will be no refuge here for anti-Semitism or at least for public aggressive anti-Semitism. I believe that the Polish people has been purified by this terrible fire. Now, to be sure, there's another document uh, written, I think, by Yitzhak Zuckerman in the illegal newspaper of a drawer that written at the same time that says just the opposite. A very few Poles sympathize with us, but most of us are happy that, that we have been taken into ghettos. They're helping ourselves, they're helping themselves to our property, and uh, they uh, welcome our persecution. And he concludes, the noble actions of Poles who've not lost elementary feelings of humanity stand out all the more against this dark background. But with the onset of mass murder in mid-42, there's a drastic change. Jews suddenly feel betrayed, not just by Polish indifference, but by what they see to an increasing extent as active Polish participation in their destruction. Now, I want to quote a writer that Professor Frubel has also quoted, uh, the Polish writer Zofia kosak Szczutska, who, despite her anti-Semitic views, called on her fellow Poles to help save Jews during the war and help found Zygota. And she writes a revealing report about her travels through the Polish countryside in the fall of 1942. And I ask your indulgence because I'm going to read a big chunk of this. And I'm quoting. At first, the behavior of the peasantry in the face of German atrocities against the Jews was humane, logical, and reasonable. It was expressed in a Christian readiness to help hungry Jews who were leaving the ghettos. That was still in 1941. However, in the second half of 1942, that is by the time the Hitlerites proceeded to mass murder, these attitudes have changed radically. Today, German bestiality has dulled the moral sensibilities of the country, has undermined moral instincts of judgment. Thunder does not strike from the sky to slay the killers of children. Blood does not cry for vengeance. Perhaps the peasants think it is really true that the Jew is damned, that someone can 
kill them without fear of punishment. Therefore, there are more and more cases of active collaboration on the part of the peasants in the German murder of the Jews. This is a very dangerous uh, precedent. Now, uh, Professor Rubel has discussed this, so I'm going to skip over something I was going to talk about just to briefly mention that one of the most important developments one of the most important developments in recent scholarship has been work on what happened to Jews who evaded the deportations to the death camps, who tried to hide, who, who went into the forest, who jumped from uh, the trains. Uh, some, Barbara Engelking, uh, estimates that the figure might be as high as 250,000. Others estimate 160,000. Very few of these Jews survived, and most of these Jews met their deaths either directly or indirectly at Polish hands. The Germans were very thinly spread in the Polish countryside. They had a terrible manpower shortage, and uh, that the, the instances of Polish, uh, not just betrayal, but gratuitous brutality are very, very numerous, and this is all gathered in these books by uh, uh, Jan Grabowski and Basha Engelkin-Boni. Now, the penalty for hiding a Jew was death, and one could understand that a peasant was not a hero and, and was not gonna take the chance on hiding a Jew, but what we're seeing in these books is how by 1943 and 1944, peasants are simply going from saying, no, I'm not gonna hide you, to actively going out of their way to hunt Jews down and to either steal their property or hand them over to uh, the Germans. And this makes for very, very uh, uh, shocking reading. Now, back to Ringelblum. When the mass extermination, what, sorry, I don't want to use the word extermination. When the mass murder of the Jews begins, Ringelblum changes his attitude in a fundamental way. Whereas before, he kept an open mind about this accusation that the Jews had betrayed Poland in the Soviet zone of occupation. Now he says that this Polish idea of the Zido Komuna, of Jewish communism, is simply a contemptible alibi for Poles to justify their own cooperation with the mass murder of Jews. He was especially shaken by the effectiveness of German anti-Semitic propaganda when the uh, mass murder of Polish officers at Katyn was disclosed in the spring of 1943. This disclosure coincided with, of course, the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto, the desperate attempt of Jews to find shelter on the Aryan side, and just when Jews needed Polish help most, that window was shut down uh, even more than before. After Ringelblum escaped from Travniki, uh, where he spent some months after the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto, he arrived in Warsaw in August 1944, and he hid in an underground bunker maintained by a Polish family, 37 other Jews, including his wife and son. And there he wrote a masterpiece, Polish-Jewish Relations in the Second World War. Now, not everything Ringelblum wrote has stood the test of time, but he didn't have graduate students, he didn't have a library, he didn't have a computer or the internet. He was in a bunker writing by the light of a carbide lamp. And he wrote a book which in many ways has stood the test of time. And in this book, Ringelblum tried to do a summing up. He felt this incredible sense of moral responsibility. He believed he was the only Jewish historian left in Poland that eight centuries of living side by side, sharing the same land that these two peoples for so many centuries had, had, had lived as neighbors and now it was ending in murder and in mutual hatred. So when Ringelblum begins this study, this Marxist compares himself to a cipher, to a Torah scribe. When a cipher sets out to copy the Torah, he must take a ritual bath in order to purify himself of all uncleanliness and impurity. 
This scribe, myself, I take my pen with a trembling heart because the smallest mistake in transcription means the destruction of the whole work. Ringelblum knew he had to get it right. He knew that there would be so many accusations, so much emotion, so much trauma that he made an incredible effort to overcome his own sense of horror and victimhood and write a history which he believed would lay out the facts in an impartial and objective manner. So this is a unique synthesis of the immediacy of contemporaneous testimony with what we might say the analytic dispassion of retrospective historical analysis. Ringelblum was writing both as a historian and as a victim. Detached historians working decades later can make necessary distinctions between perpetrators and bystanders, or at least before those terms have been questioned, between Polish and German anti-Semitism, between active complicity and indifference. For someone in Ringelblum's position who might be killed at any time, and who indeed was killed, to, for him to do that was an incredible achievement. Now, Ringelblum made a lot of key assertions here. One, no matter how much Poles were involved in the betrayal and murder of Jews, the fact is it was the Germans and not the Poles who began the Holocaust. Furthermore, the Germans were so obsessed with killing Jews that this had become so important to them that the more they lost, the more defeats they suffered, the more fanatical they were about killing Jews. That even had the Poles shown more sympathy, unless the war ended soon, few Jews would survive. Ringelblum went out of his way to pay tribute to the Poles' bravery, patriotism, courage. He pointed out how difficult it was to hide a Jew. And even though he didn't know that, we now know that at least 750 Poles were executed for hiding Jews. But Ringelblum did point out, as he was being uh, hidden by Poles, he pointed out that if a Pole hid a Jew, the biggest fear was being denounced by other Poles, that it was socially unacceptable to go out of your way to help Jews and to hide them. And Ringelblum cited an incident that he just heard, that on the streets of Warsaw, a fleeing Polish resistance fighter was running from the Germans. The Germans were in hot pursuit, but all they had to do was yell into the crowd, catch the Jew, and people stepped forward to catch him. And this never would have happened had the Germans said, catch this fleeing Polish fighter. Ringelblum also had very harsh words for the Polish underground and for the Polish home army. The Jews were outside the sphere of moral responsibility. The Jews were aliens. They were not part of the community. They, the Polish home army and underground government made minimal efforts to deal with the plague of, of the blackmailers. Many Jews in the forests were hunted down by the Armia Krajowa, by the AK, although there were elements in the Aka who, who actually helped Jews. Uh, so in standing up to the Germans, the Poles showed great courage, but confronted with the mass murder of their fellow citizens, the Poles failed. And that was Ringelblum's final verdict. I want to end this talk by referring to two uh, Jews, poets, who both were killed during the Holocaust and who both wrote poetry in the Polish language. Władysław Schlengel felt a deep tie to Polish culture and the sting of perceived abandonment and betrayal exacerbated his loneliness and uh, dread. He wrote a poem called The Telephone He's sitting by a telephone in the ghetto, and he wants to call his Polish friends from before the war, but he knows that they won't want to talk to him, and so the only number he dials is the automatic time signal. How great it is to talk to you, no quarrels, no words. You are nicer, my little time clock, 
than all my former friends. In The Janitor Has the Key, he described how once the Polish janitor Wisniewski and he, the Jewish poet, had been comrades in arms, going off to fight for Poland in 1939. And then the war started. And one day Schlengel saw Wisniewski drunk and happy wearing the poet's fur coat. You've won the war, my Wisniewski. You don't even have to think about tomorrow. You scum. How do you enjoy the coat you acquired so easily? And finally, an amazing woman, Zuzana Ginchanka, who was murdered in 1944. She was denounced by a woman who wanted to get her things. And she wrote this poem, which somehow survived, Non Omnis Moriar. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the only time that I know where a poem was actually used in a judicial uh, proceeding as evidence against the woman who denounced her. And this is where I'll stop. Uh, <clears throat> Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love when it does not love the neighbor and all his belongings. Always ready those belongings to remove. You, Miss Khominova, you are my neighbor. You will inherit the things after I am taken. I have no worldly heir. You have informed on me in order to speed up my journey to heaven. Soon you'll be ready to search for that Jewish gold. It must be hidden in quilts, pillows of down. You'll rip them open, and the feathers from the pillows will stick to your hands and arms, still wet with my blood. With those hands like wings, you will be an angel and you will be ready to fly straight to heaven. Thank you. <laughs>